The new house was everything they had dreamed of. Tucked away on the outskirts of a quiet town, it sat on an acre of dense wooded land. The Johnsons, Sarah, her husband Mark, and their six-year-old daughter Emily, moved in on a crisp autumn morning. The air was thick with the earthy scent of fallen leaves, and the house, with its rustic charm, seemed like the perfect escape from the chaos of city life. On their first night, as they unpacked, Sarah noticed something odd. The living room wall had a faint stain near the baseboard, just under the window. It looked like water damage, dark and sprawling like the veins of a dead leaf. She made a mental note to mention it to Mark, but with boxes everywhere and Emily chattering excitedly about her new room, it slipped her mind. That night, they were jolted awake by the sound of Emily screaming. Rushing into her room, they found her trembling under the covers. There was someone in the corner. She cried, pointing to the shadowed area by her closet. Mark flipped on the lights, but the room was empty. He reassured her, attributing her fright to an overactive imagination. But Sarah couldn't shake the unease that lingered as she tucked Emily back into bed. The next day, while Mark was at work and Emily was at school, Sarah decided to clean the house thoroughly. As she scrubbed the stain in the living room, she realized it wasn't water damage. It smelled metallic, like rust or blood. Her stomach turned as she worked harder to remove it, but no matter how much she scrubbed, it wouldn't budge. By late afternoon, the stain seemed darker than before, almost pulsating in the dim light. That evening, Emily refused to go to bed. She clung to Sarah's arm, whispering about the man in the corner. When pressed, she described him in chilling detail, tall with hollow eyes and a twisted smile that stretched unnaturally across his face. Sarah's heart raced as she listened, though she tried to maintain a calm facade. It's just a bad dream, she reassured Emily, though her voice quivered. As the nights went on, the disturbances grew worse. Doors slammed without warning. Footsteps echoed down the hall when no one was there. Once, Sarah woke to the sound of muffled sobbing and found Emily sitting at the edge of her bed, staring at the wall. When asked what was wrong, Emily simply said, He's watching us. Mark was skeptical, chalking it all up to the stress of the move. But... Sarah began to feel the weight of something unseen pressing against her. She started noticing odd things during the day, too. Whispers that seemed to come from the walls, fleeting shadows darting past the windows, and that damn stain in the living room growing darker, spreading like a malignant tumor. One night, as they lay in bed, Sarah heard it. A faint tapping coming from inside the walls. She nudged Mark awake, and he reluctantly got up to investigate. Following the sound to the basement, he discovered a small, locked door they hadn't noticed before. The key was nowhere to be found, but Mark, ever the handyman, pried it open with a crowbar. The stench hit them first, something rotting, sour, and old. Inside was a narrow crawl space filled with debris, broken toys, scraps of fabric, and what looked like the bones of small animals. Sarah recoiled, covering her mouth. Mark muttered something about calling a pest control company, but as he turned to leave, Sarah noticed a small notebook tucked between two loose bricks. She pulled it out and opened it. The pages were filled with jagged handwriting, almost illegible in places. It was a journal. Though the entries were fragmented and disjointed, they spoke of the watcher, the shadows, and an overwhelming sense of being hunted. The final entry sent chills down Sarah's spine. He comes at night. He wants us gone. That night, they locked every door and window, leaving lights on throughout the house. But it didn't matter. At 3.07 a.m., the tapping started again, louder this time. It moved from the walls to the floor, then to the ceiling, a maddening rhythm that seemed to come from everywhere at once. Emily began screaming again, her cries piercing through the chaos. When they reached her room, the air was icy cold. Emily was standing in the corner, her back to them, mumbling something under her breath. Sarah froze as she realized Emily was speaking in a voice that wasn't her own, low, guttural, and filled with malice. Mark grabbed her and shook her gently, trying to snap her out of it. Emily! Emily, wake up! Her head snapped around, and for a moment, her eyes weren't hers. They were hollow, black pits, just as she had described the man in her nightmares. Then, just as suddenly, they were normal again. She blinked, confused, and burst into tears. The next morning, Sarah and Mark decided they couldn't stay in the house another night. They packed hastily, planning to spend the night in a hotel. 
As they were leaving, Sarah noticed something that made her blood run cold. The stain on the living room wall had changed. It now formed the shape of a face, grinning wickedly. And worse, Emily's drawings, taped to the refrigerator, now included a figure standing behind their family, always in the shadows, always watching. They never went back to the house. A week later, Sarah did some digging and learned that the previous owners had vanished without a trace. The house had stood empty for years before they bought it. Months passed, but the nightmares followed them. Emily still spoke of the man in the corner, and Sarah sometimes woke to find her staring at the wall, whispering in that same chilling voice. The watcher, it seemed, had found them, and he wasn't letting go. The house at the end of Hollow Creek Road had been empty for years, shrouded in whispered rumors that only deepened its eerie allure. Jenna and Kyle had heard the stories before they bought it. A woman had gone mad there, claiming the walls watched her and vanished without a trace. But the price was unbeatable, and they chalked up the rumors to small-town superstition. Their first night in the house felt odd, as though the walls were holding their breath. The power wasn't yet connected, so they ate takeout by candlelight. Jenna felt the air grow colder with every flicker of the flame, but Kyle laughed it off. Old houses creak, he said. It's part of the charm. Around midnight, Jenna was awoken by a faint sound, a low, rhythmic thumping like someone knocking lightly on the walls. She nudged Kyle awake, and they lay in silence, listening. The sound grew louder, moving through the house as if searching. Kyle grabbed a flashlight and went to investigate, but found nothing except shadows stretching too far in the dim light. When they returned to bed, the thumping stopped, but Jenna couldn't shake the feeling they were being watched. The next morning, while unpacking in the kitchen, Jenna noticed something peculiar. The window above the sink didn't reflect the room correctly. The countertop was the wrong color, the walls were bare, and there was something off about the figure standing behind her in the reflection. Heart racing, she turned, but no one was there. That night, they both heard it, whispering. It started as a faint murmur, like wind slipping through cracks, but grew distinct as the hours passed. The voices seemed to come from the walls, overlapping, speaking words in a language neither of them understood. Jenna pressed her ear against the cold plaster, only to leap back as the wall groaned, almost shifting. By the third night, Jenna refused to sleep. She sat up in bed, clutching a flashlight, while Kyle snored beside her. Around 2 a.m., she heard it again, soft thumping, but now accompanied by faint scratching. It was coming from above them, moving across the ceiling. Slowly, it made its way down the walls and stopped right outside their bedroom door. Her breath caught in her throat as the doorknob began to rattle, softly at first, then violently. Kyle! She hissed, shaking him awake. What? He groaned, still half asleep. Before she could answer, the door creaked open on its own, revealing the dark hallway beyond. Jenna's flashlight beam shook as she aimed it into the void, but there was nothing there, just the faint sound of footsteps retreating down the stairs. The next day, Kyle found scratches on the inside of the bedroom door. They weren't random marks. They formed symbols, intricate and jagged. Probably the previous owner's messing around, he said, though his voice lacked conviction. Jenna noticed his hand tremble as he painted over the marks. That evening, while Kyle worked late, Jenna decided to explore the basement. She hadn't been down there yet. The realtor had warned it was damp and unfinished, but curiosity got the better of her. As she descended, the air grew colder, heavy with a metallic scent that made her stomach churn. The basement was empty save for a single wooden chair in the center of the room. On the floor beneath it, she noticed a dark stain, circular and oddly precise. As she stared at it, her vision blurred, and she swore she could hear something faint, a muffled scream, distant and distorted like it was trapped beneath the floorboards. The chair creaked, though she hadn't touched it, and the room seemed to tilt for a moment before she ran back upstairs, slamming the door behind her. Kyle came home to find her pale and shaking. She tried to explain what had happened, but he waved it off. You're just freaked out from all these noises, he said. That night, he insisted they sleep in separate rooms so they could get some space. Around 3 a.m., Jenna woke to a loud crash. Heart pounding, she ran to Kyle's room, but it was empty. The bed was unmade, and the window was wide open, though the night was bitterly cold. She called his name, her voice echoing through the house, but there was no response. 
As she searched, she realized the house had changed. The hallways stretched unnaturally long, the walls narrowing in. Shadows moved in ways they shouldn't, creeping toward her no matter where she turned the flashlight. The whispering returned, louder now, frantic and desperate, as if the house itself was alive and angry. She found Kyle in the basement. He was standing in the center of the room, facing the chair, his head tilted slightly as though listening to something. Kyle? She whispered, stepping closer. He didn't respond. She reached out to touch his shoulder, but the, but the moment her fingers grazed his skin, his head snapped around. His eyes were wide, bloodshot, and his mouth was twisted into an unnatural grin. She's in the walls, he rasped, his voice layered with something that wasn't his own. Before she could scream, he lunged at her. Jenna woke in the hospital, disoriented and weak. The police told her she had been found wandering along Hollow Creek Road, barefoot and covered in scratches. The house, they said, was empty when they checked. Kyle was never found. She never went back. But even now, in her small apartment miles away, she hears the thumping at night, growing louder. And sometimes, just as she drifts to sleep, she swears she hears his voice whispering from the walls. The old Victorian house had always stood out in the neighborhood, a looming, decaying silhouette against the sky. When Mia inherited it from an estranged great-aunt she barely remembered, she considered selling it immediately. But something about the house drew her in. Maybe it was the mystery of why her great-aunt had left it to her. Maybe it was the lure of starting over after her divorce. Either way, she packed her things and moved in, ignoring the warnings from locals about the widow's watch. The first few days were uneventful, though the house creaked and groaned as if adjusting to its new occupant. Dust coated every surface, and the faded wallpaper seemed to peel a little more each day. At night, the wind howled through the gaps in the windows, sounding eerily like someone crying. Mia chalked it up to the house's age and shrugged it off. But then she found the diary. It was tucked away in the back of a drawer in the upstairs bedroom, a small, leather-bound book with pages yellowed by time. The handwriting inside was elegant, the words written in a trembling hand. The entries belonged to her great-aunt, Eleanor, and they quickly took a dark turn. The house watches me. I feel its eyes in every shadow. I hear her at night, walking the halls. She whispers my name, calling me to the attic. I don't think I can leave. She won't let me. Mia's stomach churned as she read the final entry. If you find this, please forgive me. She's stronger than I am. I hope she spares you. That night, Mia was jolted awake by a noise above her. A heavy thud, like something being dragged across the attic floor. Heart pounding, she grabbed a flashlight and made her way up the narrow staircase. The attic door resisted as though something on the other side was pressing against it, but with a shove, it creaked open. The air was thick, almost choking, and the beam of her flashlight caught movement in the corner of the room. A rocking chair was swaying, its wood groaning with each motion. But there was no wind, no draft, and no one else there. Then the smell hit her a sickly sweet odor like rotting flowers. Her flashlight flickered and for a moment she thought she saw a figure sitting in the chair, head bowed. When the light steadied, it was gone. Mia didn't sleep that night. She spent the next day researching the house and her great aunt. What she found chilled her to the bone. In the 1920s, the house had belonged to a woman named Margaret Blackwell, known locally as the Widow. She had been accused of poisoning her husband, though the charges were dropped for lack of evidence. Not long after, she vanished, and rumors of her ghost haunting the house began to circulate. Eleanor had bought the property decades later, but neighbors claimed she became reclusive, rarely leaving the house until she, she too disappeared. As the days passed, the house became more oppressive. Doors opened and closed on their own. Objects moved from where she'd left them. The crying sound grew louder at night, and Mia swore she felt a presence watching her breathing down her neck. One evening, as she stood in the kitchen, the power went out. The sudden darkness was suffocating, and the silence that followed was deafening. Then, from somewhere upstairs, she heard a voice, a low, guttural whisper calling her name. Mia, come. Frozen in fear, she gripped the counter for support. The voice came again, louder this time, more insistent. Mia, I'm waiting. Against her better judgment, she followed the voice. It led her to the attic, where the rocking chair was moving again, faster now, as though someone invisible was rocking violently. The smell of decay was overwhelming. 
Mia's flashlight flickered, and in the brief moments of light, she saw her. A woman, pale and gaunt, with hollow eyes and a mouth twisted into a grotesque grin, stood beside the chair. Her hands stretched out, skeletal fingers curling toward Mia. You shouldn't have come, the woman hissed, her voice echoing unnaturally. You're mine now. Mia stumbled back, her foot catching on the edge of the staircase. She fell, tumbling down the steps, and everything went black. When she woke, she was in the hospital. A neighbor had found her unconscious on the porch, mumbling incoherently about the attic. The doctors dismissed it as a stress-induced episode, but Mia knew the truth. She sold the house within a week, taking a financial loss just to get rid of it. The new owners moved in shortly after, despite her warnings. Months later, Mia received an email from the couple. It was brief. Did you ever hear her? The woman in the attic? Mia didn't reply. But every night since, she hears that same voice in her dreams whispering her name, calling her back to the widow's watch. The old farmhouse had sat abandoned for decades, its windows dark and lifeless, its paint peeling away like dead skin. When Tyler and his friends stumbled across it during a weekend hike, the allure of exploring something forbidden was irresistible. The four of them, Tyler, Sam, Chris, and Jess, were adrenaline junkies, always on the hunt for their next thrill. The decaying house seemed perfect. The front door groaned as they pushed it open, the hinges screaming in protest. The air inside was damp and heavy, carrying the faint stench of mold and decay. Dust motes danced in the sunlight streaming through the broken windows, and the floorboards creaked under their weight. The house was a time capsule, filled with rotting furniture and remnants of a family's life long forgotten. Faded photographs hung crookedly on the walls, their faces blurred by time. This is so creepy, Jess whispered, clutching her phone, its flashlight illuminating the dim room. Creepy? It's awesome, Sam said, stepping further inside, his sneakers crunching on broken glass. We'll get some epic photos for sure. As they ventured deeper into the house, the atmosphere grew heavier, like the house itself was pressing down on them. Tyler couldn't shake the feeling that they were being watched though he dismissed it as nerves. Then they found the basement door. It was locked with a heavy iron padlock, but Chris, ever resourceful, produced a crowbar from his backpack. Let's see what secrets this place is hiding, he grinned, prying the lock loose. The basement was worse than the rest of the house. The air was colder, biting and damp, and the darkness seemed alive. Their flashlights revealed stone walls etched with strange, jagged symbols. In the center of the room stood a single wooden chair, its arms fitted with rusted metal restraints. Dried stains, dark and almost black, covered the floor beneath it. Okay, now it's officially creepy, Jess muttered, her voice trembling. Looks like some kind of ritual room? Chris suggested, his voice losing its usual bravado. No way, Sam scoffed, though he avoided stepping too close to the chair. Tyler's stomach churned as he scanned the symbols. They seemed to twist and shift under the flashlight beams, forming shapes that made his eyes water and his head ache. He felt something brush against his shoulder and spun around, but no one was there. We should leave, Jess said firmly. Now. Before anyone could respond, the basement door slammed shut above them, the sound echoing like a gunshot shot. The group froze, their breaths quick and shallow. Sam bolted up the stairs, yanking at the handle, but it wouldn't budge. It's stuck, he shouted, slamming his shoulder against the door. It won't open. Tyler's flashlight flickered, and the shadows around them seemed to ripple and grow. The symbols on the walls began to glow faintly, pulsating like a heartbeat. A low, guttural whisper filled the room, coming from everywhere and nowhere all at once. Do you hear that? Jess whimpered, clutching Tyler's arm. The whispers grew louder, merging into a chorus of unintelligible words. Then... The chair in the center of the room moved, slowly at first, scraping against the stone floor, but then it tipped forward as if something unseen had risen from it. The temperature plummeted. Tyler's breath came out in clouds as his flashlight failed completely, plunging them into darkness. Chris screamed, a high, piercing sound, and the others turned their lights toward him. He was clawing at his throat, his eyes wide with terror. It's, it's on me, he gasped, though nothing was visible. Get him out of here, Tyler shouted grabbing Chris and dragging him toward the stairs. Sam and Jess followed, their flashlights shaking as the whispers turned into a deafening roar. Then the laughter started. It was cold and hollow, echoing off the walls, a sound that seemed to come from deep within the house itself. 
Tyler froze as the shadows around them began to take shape. Twisted, human-like figures with elongated limbs and eyeless faces. They moved unnaturally, jerking and bending in ways that defied logic, closing in on the group. Run! Jess screamed, shoving Tyler up the stairs. They pounded on the basement door, screaming for help, but the laughter only grew louder. Tyler turned back, his flashlight flickering just long enough to see one of the shadow figures grab Sam. He was yanked backward into the darkness, his screams cutting off abruptly. Sam! Jess shrieked, but Tyler grabbed her, forcing her to climb. Chris, still choking and gasping, collapsed near the top of the stairs. The shadows surged toward him, and Tyler pulled Jess through the door just as it finally gave way. They slammed it shut behind them, leaving Chris behind. His screams echoed through the house before falling silent. Tyler and Jess didn't stop running. They tore through the house, not caring about the broken furniture or shards of glass in their path. The front door, which had opened so easily before, resisted them now, but Tyler threw his entire weight against it, and they stumbled out into the daylight. They didn't stop until they reached the road, their lungs burning and their hearts racing. When they looked back, the house stood as it always had, silent and still, as if mocking them. The police found no sign of Sam or Chris. The basement was sealed shut, the lock intact, and the symbols on the walls were gone. They dismissed Tyler and Jess's story as hysteria, claiming the others had likely run off or gotten lost in the woods. But Tyler knew the truth. He could still hear the laughter in his dreams, still see the twisted shapes in the shadows. And sometimes, late at night, he felt cold fingers brush against his neck, as if something from that house had followed him home. The storm had rolled in quickly, bringing with it a sharp wind and sheets of relentless rain. Emma and her husband Daniel hadn't planned on staying in the old house overnight. They'd bought it as a fixer-upper, a rural escape from their cramped city apartment. But tonight the weather left them stranded. The house was isolated, sitting alone on an overgrown property miles from the nearest neighbor. Its age showed in the sagging roof, cracked windows, and peeling paint. Inside, the air smelled faintly of mildew, and something else Emma couldn't quite place. A metallic tang that lingered no matter how much fresh air they tried to let in. By the time the power went out, the sun had dipped below the horizon, leaving them in near total darkness. Armed with flashlights and candles, they decided to hunker down in the living room, close to the old fireplace. This place definitely needs some work, Daniel said, attempting to lighten the mood as he struggled to ignite damp logs. Emma nodded but couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The house groaned and settled around them, the sound amplified by the storm outside. She wrapped her blanket tighter and stared at the walls, where faint outlines of old wallpaper patterns seemed to shift in the flickering candlelight. Did you hear that? She asked suddenly. Daniel looked up from the fire, frowning. Hear what? A faint sound drifted from upstairs, a soft, rhythmic creaking like footsteps crossing the old wooden floor. Emma's heart began to race. It's probably just the wind, Daniel said, but he didn't sound convinced. The creaking grew louder, moving steadily toward the top of the stairs. Daniel grabbed a flashlight, his jaw tightening. I'll check it out, he said, though Emma could see the hesitation in his eyes. No, she whispered, grabbing his arm. Just stay here. It's an old house. It's probably nothing. But Daniel was already walking toward the staircase. The beam of his flashlight wavered as he climbed, the old steps groaning beneath his weight. Emma stayed frozen in place, her ears straining to hear any sign of him. A long silence followed. Daniel, she called, her voice trembling. No response. She stood, gripping her flashlight tightly and edged toward the stairs. The air felt colder here, heavier. The beam of her flashlight barely pierced the darkness as she climbed, each step louder than the last. Daniel? She called again, her voice barely above a whisper. When she reached the top, she saw him standing at the end of the hallway, his back to her. The flashlight hung limp in his hand, its beam pointed at the floor. Daniel, what are you doing? She asked, her voice cracking. He didn't move. She stepped closer, and that's when she saw the door. It was at the end of the hall, half hidden behind an old bookshelf that had been shoved to the side. She didn't remember seeing it during the walkthrough, and something about it felt wrong, like it shouldn't be there. Emma, Daniel said suddenly, his voice low and strained. Don't come any closer. What is it? She asked, her voice quivering. There's something behind the door, he said. I can hear it. 
Emma's flashlight flickered, and for a moment she thought she saw the door tremble, as if something on the other side had pressed against it. Let's go back downstairs, she said, tugging at his arm, but he didn't budge. Listen, he whispered. She strained her ears, and then she heard it, a faint scratching, like nails dragging across wood. It was soft at first, but it grew louder, more frantic. The door shook in its frame. Emma, we need to leave, Daniel said, his voice barely audible. Before they could move, the door burst open. The darkness beyond was impenetrable, but Emma could feel something moving, shifting in the black void. A wave of icy air rushed out, carrying with it that same metallic smell, now overpowering. Shadows seemed to spill into the hallway, twisting and writhing, and a sound, low and guttural, almost like breathing, echoed through the space. Emma screamed as something cold and unseen brushed against her arm. Daniel grabbed her hand, and they bolted down the stairs, their flashlights swinging wildly. Uh, the shadows seemed to follow, stretching unnaturally across the walls. They didn't stop until they were outside, the rain drenching them as they fumbled with the car keys. Daniel started the engine, and they, they sped away without looking back. The next day, they returned with a locksmith and a contractor to assess the damage. But when they searched the house, the door at the end of the hallway was gone. The wall where it had been was seamless, as if it had never existed. Emma refused to go back after that, and the house sat vacant for months until they sold it. The new owners, a young couple, were thrilled to take it off their hands. But sometimes late at night, Emma wakes up drenched in sweat, haunted by dreams of that door. And in her dreams, the scratching never stops. The Wilkersons' move to the quiet countryside was supposed to be a fresh start. Their new house, an expansive colonial with a wraparound porch, sat at the edge of an old forest. The realtor had mentioned its history. A family that once lived there had mysteriously disappeared, but the Wilkersons dismissed it as small-town gossip. The house was charming, affordable, and exactly what they needed. The first few days were peaceful. The family, Mark, his wife, Laura, and their seven-year-old daughter, Sophie, settled in quickly. Sophie was thrilled by the house's sheer size, running through the hallways and exploring every room. She was especially fascinated by the attic, a dusty space filled with cobweb boxes and old furniture. One afternoon, Sophie came downstairs clutching a worn porcelain doll. Its face was cracked, its dress faded and stained. I found her in the attic, she said, holding the doll up proudly. Her name is Clara. Laura frowned. Maybe we shouldn't play with that, sweetie. It's probably very old and dirty. She says it's okay, Sophie replied with a grin, hugging the doll tightly. That night, Laura was awakened by a sound, a faint giggle coming from Sophie's room. She smiled sleepily, assuming Sophie was talking in her sleep. But the giggle came again, louder this time, followed by a soft thump. Laura got up to check on her daughter. When she opened Sophie's door, her stomach dropped. Sophie was sitting upright in bed, her wide eyes fixed on Clara, who was propped against the wall. The doll's head was tilted slightly, its glass eyes reflecting the moonlight streaming through the window. Sophie, are you okay? Laura asked, stepping into the room. She doesn't like you. Sophie whispered, clutching her blanket. Who doesn't? Clara, Sophie said, her voice barely audible. She said you shouldn't come in here. A chill ran down Laura's spine, but she forced a smile. It's just a doll, sweetheart. Go back to sleep. As Laura reached out to move Clara, Sophie screamed. The sound was raw and primal, unlike anything Laura had ever heard from her daughter. She froze, her hand hovering above the doll. Sophie's scream stopped abruptly, and she fell back onto the pillow, her breathing deep and even, as though she'd never been awake at all. Laura left the doll where it was. The next morning, Laura told Mark what had happened. He laughed it off. Kids have imaginations. It's just a creepy old doll. Don't worry about it. But Laura couldn't shake the unease. The day passed uneventfully until Sophie refused to eat dinner, saying Clara didn't like the food. Later, when Laura tried to tuck her in, Sophie whispered, Clara says you're in her house now. That night, the strange noises began. Footsteps echoed through the upstairs hallway, though everyone was in bed. Laura woke Mark, but when he checked, the hall was empty. Then came the whispers, soft, unintelligible, and everywhere at once. By the third night, Laura was at her breaking point. She went to Sophie's room, determined to get rid of the doll. But when she reached for it, Sophie's voice stopped her cold. She doesn't want you to take her. Sophie, this is just a doll. It's not real, Laura said firmly. 
grabbing Clara by the arm. The room went cold. The overhead light flickered and Laura swore she heard a faint laugh. Sophie sat up, her expression blank. She told me to warn you, she said in a voice that wasn't her own. Laura dropped the doll and stumbled back. Its head turned slightly, its lifeless eyes staring straight at her. She backed out of the room and slammed the door. Mark, now thoroughly spooked, agreed they needed to leave. We'll figure this out in the morning, he said. Let's get some sleep. But sleep didn't come. The whispers turned into banging, loud and furious, as though something was trying to break through the walls. Sophie screamed from her room, but when Laura and Mark ran to her, the door wouldn't budge. They pounded on it, shouting her name, but the only response was laughter. Ah, uh, high-pitched, manic, and echoing. Finally, the door gave way, and they found Sophie sitting on the floor, Clara in her lap. She was humming softly, rocking back and forth. The room was freezing, and the walls were covered in scratches, deep, jagged marks that formed strange, looping symbols. Time to go, Mark said, grabbing Sophie and pulling her away from the doll. As they ran downstairs, the house seemed to come alive. Doors slammed shut on their own, the air thick with an oppressive energy. Shadows flickered across the walls, and the laughter followed them, growing louder and more distorted. They didn't stop until they were in their car, speeding down the gravel driveway. Sophie sat in the back seat, desk her face pale and tear-streaked. She's still in the house, she whispered, but she said she'll find me. Mark and Laura sold the house within weeks, leaving most of their belongings behind, including Clara. They moved back to the city, desperate to put the experience behind them. But Sophie hasn't been the same since. Sometimes Laura catches her staring at empty corners, her lips moving as though she's whispering to someone. And at night, when the house is silent, they can all hear it, the faint sound of porcelain tapping against the floor. It was supposed to be a peaceful retreat. Hannah had booked the remote cabin deep in the woods to escape the pressures of her hectic job and the suffocating buzz of city life. It was small and rustic, just what she needed. An isolated haven where she could finally unwind. The property was picturesque, surrounded by towering trees whose leaves danced in the breeze, their rustling a soothing backdrop to her thoughts. The inside was simple. A kitchen, a living area with a stone fireplace, a single bedroom, and a loft. She felt a strange stillness in the air as she unlocked the front door, but brushed it off as nervous excitement. The first day passed uneventfully. She spent her time hiking the trails nearby and enjoying the quiet. That night, she lit a fire and curled up with a book. The sound of the crackling flames and the occasional howl of distant wildlife lulled her into a sense of calm. But as the fire began to die, she heard it, a faint knocking at the window. Hannah froze, her eyes darting toward the sound. The window faced the forest, and in the dim glow of the firelight, she saw nothing but her own reflection. It's probably a bird, she muttered, shaking her head. Still, she couldn't help but feel uneasy. She went to bed early, but sleep didn't come easily. The cabin creaked and groaned, and she was acutely aware of how alone she was. Sometime after midnight, she woke with a start. The knocking had returned, louder this time. Three sharp raps, deliberate and rhythmic. Her heart pounded as she reached for her phone, but there was no signal. Gripping the flashlight she'd left on the nightstand, she crept toward the window. The beam of light cut through the darkness outside, illuminating only the dense woods. No animals, no branches, tapping the glass. Nothing. She closed the curtains tightly and climbed back into bed, her nerves raw. But the knocking continued moving now as if circling the cabin. It tapped on the kitchen window, then the loft, then the front door. Each sound was precise and purposeful. Who's there? She finally called out, her voice shaking. The knocking stopped. Silence stretched, heavy and suffocating. Then from somewhere deep in the woods came a laugh. It was low and guttural, a sound that didn't belong to anything human. Hannah's stomach turned. She grabbed her car keys and threw on her coat, determined to leave even if it meant driving through the night. As she opened the door, a gust of icy wind blew past her, extinguishing the fire and plunging the room into darkness. The flashlight flickered and died. Panic set in. She slammed the door shut and locked it, her breath coming in shallow gasps. Her hands trembled as she fumbled for matches to relight the fire, desperate for light. As she struck the match, she caught movement out of the corner of her eye. A shadow, tall and thin, standing just outside the window, 
The match burned out in her hand and she let out a cry of pain. When she looked again, the shadow was gone. Something scratched against the door, long and deliberate like claws dragging across the wood. The sound filled the cabin, sending shivers down her spine. Hannah backed away, clutching a fire poker as if it could protect her. Leave me alone, she screamed, her voice echoing in the empty space. The scratching stopped. But then, from the loft, came a voice, a perfect mimic of her own. Leave me alone, it said, the words distorted and mocking. Hannah's blood ran cold. The voice laughed, a sick, wheezing sound that made her knees buckle. She turned and ran, bolting for the bedroom and slamming the door behind her. She shoved the dresser against it, her hands shaking uncontrollably. The laughter continued, growing louder, filling every corner of the cabin. Then it stopped, and the silence was worse. Hannah crouched by the bed, holding her fire poker tightly, her ears straining for any sound. Hours passed, or maybe it was minutes. Time felt meaningless in the dark. Just as she began to think it was over, she heard footsteps. Slow, deliberate, they moved down the hall toward her door. Hannah, her own voice called from the other side, let me in. She clamped her hands over her ears, rocking back and forth, whispering, it's not real, it's not real. The door rattled as something pushed against it, the dresser scraping across the floor. Hannah screamed, tears streaming down her face. The pressure stopped and once again, silence fell. When dawn finally broke, the sunlight streaming through the bedroom window felt like salvation. She emerged from her hiding spot, her muscles stiff and her throat raw. The cabin was still, the morning light making it seem almost normal again. She didn't stay to question what had happened. She grabbed her belongings and fled, leaving the door wide open behind her. Weeks later, back in the city, she couldn't shake the feeling that she was being watched. She kept her curtains drawn, her doors locked, but the unease never left. One night, as she lay in bed, her phone buzzed. It was a message from an unknown number. It read, let me in. She dropped the phone, her breath catching in her throat. A moment later, she heard it, the faint, rhythmic knocking on her apartment window. The car's headlights cut through the mist as Rachel drove down the desolate, winding road. The GPS had insisted this was the shortest route to her destination, but as the dense woods closed in around her, she regretted trusting it. The trees stood like silent sentinels, their gnarled branches clawing at the starless sky. Her fuel gauge dipped toward empty. She hadn't passed a gas station in hours, and her phone had lost signal miles back. Anxiety gnawed at her as the narrow road seemed to stretch endlessly into the dark. Then she saw it, a small wooden sign barely visible in her headlights. Black Hollow Inn, one mile. Relieved, Rachel decided to stop for the night. The inn materialized moments later, emerging from the fog like a ghostly apparition. It was a sprawling Victorian mansion, its windows dark and unwelcoming. The paint was peeling, and the surrounding garden had long since been overtaken by weeds. Despite its decrepit state, a faint light flickered in the front window, suggesting someone was home. Rachel hesitated, but had no other options. She parked the car and stepped out, the cold biting through her jacket. The wind carried an odd scent, damp earth mixed with something metallic. The front door creaked open before she even knocked. A tall, thin man stood in the doorway, his face partially obscured by shadows. His pale skin and sunken eyes gave him a cadaverous appearance, but his smile was polite. Welcome, he said, his voice soft and measured. You must be tired from your journey. Ah, uh, yes. I was hoping to find a room for the night, Rachel stammered, uneasy under his gaze. Of course, he said, stepping aside. We don't get many visitors these days. The foyer was dimly lit by a single chandelier, its bulbs flickering weakly. The wallpaper was faded and peeling, and the air smelled of mildew. The man introduced himself as Mr. Gray and led her to a room on the second floor. It was small but clean, with a four-poster bed and a single oil lamp on the nightstand. If you need anything, just ring the bell by the door, he said before disappearing down the hall without another word. Rachel locked the door behind him, her nerves still on edge. She told herself she was being paranoid. Old buildings always felt creepy. Exhausted, she climbed into bed, her body sinking into the surprisingly soft mattress. Sleep didn't come easily. The house was far from silent. Creaks and groans echoed through the walls, and faint whispers seemed to drift just beyond her hearing. She told herself it was the wind or the old plumbing, but her heart refused to settle. Sometime in the middle of the night, she woke abruptly. 
At first, she didn't know why. Then she heard it, a soft, rhythmic tapping on her door. Tap, tap, tap! Mr. Gray, she called, her voice hoarse. No response. The tapping continued, slow and deliberate. Rachel got out of bed, every instinct screaming at her to stay put, and approached the door. She hesitated, then peered through the peephole. There was no one there. Her breath caught in her throat as the tapping stopped, replaced by a faint scraping sound as though something sharp was being dragged across the wood. Panic surged through her and she backed away from the door. Suddenly, the oil lamp flickered violently before extinguishing entirely, plunging the room into darkness. Rachel fumbled for her phone, using its flashlight to illuminate the room. The scraping sound grew louder, more frantic, then stopped altogether. Silence fell, thick and oppressive. A new sound broke the quiet, a creak from the corner of the room. She swung her flashlight toward it, her hand shaking. For a moment, she saw nothing but the empty chair by the window. Then she noticed it. The faint outline of something crouched in the shadows, its body unnaturally long and thin. Who's there? She whispered, her voice trembling. The thing moved, unfolding itself like a spider, its limbs grotesquely elongated. Its face was featureless, save for two glowing white eyes that locked onto her. Rachel screamed, stumbling back toward the door. She clawed at the lock, finally yanking the door open and bolting into the hallway. The air felt colder out here, and the flickering sconces cast eerie shadows along the walls. She ran, her footsteps echoing loudly. She didn't know where she was going, only that she needed to get out. The whispers started again, louder this time, seeming to come from all directions. At the end of the hall, she saw a staircase and sprinted toward it. But as she reached the top step, she froze. The figure was there, standing at the bottom of the stairs, its glowing eyes staring up at her. It tilted its head as if curious, then began to ascend, its movements jerky and unnatural. Rachel turned and ran in the opposite direction, throwing open doors at random, desperate for an escape. Finally, she found herself in what looked like an old storage room. She slammed the door shut and pressed her back against it, her breathing ragged. The whispers grew louder, accompanied by the sound of footsteps. Then they stopped. Silence fell once more. Rachel dared to hope she'd lost it. She turned to scan the room, her flashlight sweeping across dusty shelves and old furniture. Then behind her, she heard a voice, soft and mocking. Why are you hiding? She spun around and the thing was there mere inches from her. Its eyes burned like fire and its two wide mouth stretched into a grotesque smile. Rachel's scream echoed through the inn, swallowed by the endless dark. The next morning, Mr. Gray stood at the front desk, polishing a set of old keys. He looked up as another traveler entered, their face tired and hopeful. Welcome, he said with a polite smile. You must be tired from your journey. The Petersons had been warned about buying the house. Locals in the small town called it the Hollow House, though no one could agree why. The price was suspiciously low for such a sprawling property, but Emily and Peter dismissed the warnings as rural superstition. They'd been searching for a place to raise their two young boys, and the old Victorian at the edge of the woods seemed perfect. Perfect. The first week was uneventful, though Emily noticed an odd feeling in the house. The air felt thick, as if it pressed against her skin. Sometimes she thought she saw movement in her peripheral vision, shadows that shouldn't have been there. But there was always a rational explanation. At least that's what she told herself. It wasn't until the second week that strange things began happening. It started with Alex, their six-year-old, waking them up one night, crying about the lady in the corner. Emily hurried to his room, expecting to find him frightened of shadows cast by the moonlight. Instead, she found him huddled under his blanket, pointing toward the far corner of the room. There's no one there, sweetie, she said, stroking his hair. But her heart skipped a beat when she glanced at the corner. The air seemed darker there, almost solid, like the shadow was watching her. She said she doesn't like us here, Alex whispered. Emily shook off her unease, blaming it on a mother's overactive imagination. She tucked Alex back into bed and returned to her own room, but sleep eluded her. The next day, Peter brushed it off. Kids have nightmares. He'll forget all about it, he said. But Alex didn't forget. Over the next few nights, his nightmares worsened. He started refusing to sleep in his room, insisting that the lady was angry. Meanwhile, their youngest, three-year-old Sam, began talking to someone who wasn't there. 
Emily overheard him one afternoon in the playroom. Who are you talking to, sweetheart? She asked. Sam looked up with a wide grin. The tall man. He says he likes my toys. Emily felt a chill run down her spine. The playroom window was high and the forest outside was thick. No one could have been looking in. That night, the noises started. It was subtle at first, soft tapping at the windows, faint creaks in the floorboards. But as the week wore on, it escalated. Five doors slammed shut on their own and the sound of footsteps echoed through the house, even when everyone was accounted for. One night, Emily woke to the sound of muffled crying. She thought it was one of the boys and got up to check. But when she stepped into the hallway, the sound stopped. The house was silent, save for the faint ticking of the old grandfather clock in the foyer. She turned to go back to bed when she saw it, a figure at the end of the hall. It was tall, its shape indistinct, like a shadow that had peeled itself from the wall. Emily froze, her breath catching in her throat. She blinked, and it was gone. When she told Peter, he dismissed it as exhaustion. We've been under a lot of stress. The move, the kids, it's just your mind playing tricks on you. But Emily wasn't so sure. The breaking point came two nights later. Peter woke to the sound of Sam screaming. Both parents bolted to his room, finding the toddler standing in his crib, tears streaming down his face. He pointed toward the closet, sobbing. He's in there. Don't let him get me. Peter threw open the closet door, but it was empty. Emily picked up Sam, trying to calm him, but the boy kept repeating the same words. He was here. He was here. That night, Peter finally admitted something was wrong. Maybe we should call someone, he said, his voice strained. But before they could act, the house itself turned against them. Lights flickered violently, then went out completely. The air grew heavy, and a deep, guttural moan echoed through the halls. The boys screamed as their bedroom doors slammed shut. Emily and Peter pounded on the doors, but they wouldn't budge. Alex! Sam! Emily cried, panic rising in her chest. From behind the doors came the boys' terrified screams, mingled with other sounds, whispering voices and something wet dragging across the floor. Suddenly, the doors burst open. Both boys were huddled in the corners of their rooms, unharmed but trembling. Alex looked up at his parents, his eyes wide with terror. She's coming, he whispered. The family didn't wait to find out what he meant. They grabbed what they could and fled into the night, piling into the car without looking back. As they sped away, Emily glanced in the rearview mirror. The house stood in darkness, its windows empty and lifeless. But just before the road curved out of sight, she saw a shadow in one of the upper windows, a tall figure standing perfectly still. The Petersons never returned to the hollow house. It was put back on the market where it sat for years, unsold. Locals whispered about the family who fled in the dead of night and the strange happenings that had plagued the house for generations. But sometimes on quiet nights, the neighbors swear they see lights flickering in the windows and hear the faint sound of children crying, carried on the wind. The rain was relentless, pounding on the roof of the old farmhouse as Sarah huddled by the fireplace. She'd inherited the house from her grandmother, a woman she barely knew, but who had left her the property with a cryptic note. The past is buried, but it always finds its way out. Be careful, my dear. At first, the house had seemed charming in its decrepitude a project for her to tackle after the chaos of city life. But as the days passed, its isolation began to gnaw at her. The nearest neighbor was miles away, and without a working phone line or reliable cell service, Sarah felt cut off from the world. The storm had knocked out the electricity that evening, leaving her alone in the flickering glow of the fire. The howling wind made the windows rattle, and the shadows cast by the flames seemed to dance on the peeling wallpaper. Despite the warmth, Sarah couldn't shake the feeling that she was being watched. She told herself it was nerves. The house creaked and groaned, but it was old, centuries old. Things like this were normal in such a place. Still, when she heard the sound of footsteps upstairs, her breath caught. She froze, listening intently. The wind howled, the rain lashed against the windows, but there it was again, soft, deliberate steps crossing the floor above her. Sarah's rational mind kicked in. Perhaps the storm had loosened a shutter, or an animal had found its way in. Gripping the poker from the fireplace, she climbed the narrow staircase, her heart pounding with every creak of the wood beneath her feet. The hallway upstairs was dark, the flashlight in her hand casting an uneven beam of light that barely pierced the gloom, 
She checked each room, her grip tightening on the poker as she found them empty, the doors creaking as she pushed them open. But in the last room, the attic hatch was slightly ajar. She stared at it, dread coiling in her stomach. She hadn't even realized the house had an attic. For a long moment, she stood frozen, debating whether to leave it alone. But curiosity, or foolishness, got the better of her. She reached up and pulled the cord. The ladder unfolded with a groan, and a rush of cold air spilled into the hallway. Shining her flashlight upward, Sarah saw only dust and cobwebs. Hello, she called, her voice trembling. The attic swallowed the sound. She climbed the ladder cautiously, her pulse hammering in her ears. The air was thick with the smell of mildew, and the floorboards creaked under her weight. The beam of her flashlight swept across old trunks, broken furniture, and stacks of yellowed newspapers. It all seemed harmless, untouched for decades. But then she saw it, a small rocking chair placed in the center of the attic. It faced a wall, and on it sat a porcelain doll. Its dress was tattered, its painted face cracked, but its glassy eyes seemed to glint in the flashlight's beam, staring directly at Sarah. She swallowed hard, taking a step closer. The doll was unnerving, but it was just a doll, probably something her grandmother had kept from years ago. She reached out to touch it, but before her hand could make contact, the chair began to rock, slowly at first, then faster, the wood creaking in rhythmic protest. Sarah stumbled back, nearly dropping the flashlight. She didn't wait to see more. She bolted down the ladder, slamming the attic hatch shut behind her. Her breaths came in shallow gasps as she leaned against the wall, gripping the poker like a lifeline. The house felt alive now, every creak and groan amplified in her ears. She returned to the living room, the fire now dim and barely warming the space. As she crouched to add another log, she heard it again, the footsteps. But this time they weren't upstairs. They were coming from the hallway behind her. She turned slowly, the flashlight shaking in her hand. The hallway was empty, but the footsteps continued, moving closer, though no one was there. The air grew colder, and Sarah felt a pressure building in the room, as if the walls themselves were leaning in. Leave me alone, she shouted, her voice breaking. The footsteps stopped. For a moment. Silence. Then a whisper. Soft, almost imperceptible. You shouldn't have come back. The room plunged into darkness as the fire sputtered out completely. Sarah scrambled to relight it, her fingers fumbling with the matches. She struck one, and the brief glow illuminated something behind her. A figure, tall and gaunt, its face obscured by shadow. Its head tilted unnaturally as it stared at her. The match burned out, leaving her in total darkness. Sarah ran. She didn't grab her coat, her bag, or even her car keys. She just ran out into the storm, the rain soaking her to the bone as she sprinted down the driveway toward the road. She didn't look back, not even when she thought she heard her name being called in that same soft, taunting whisper. The next morning, a passing motorist found her wandering the roadside, shivering and incoherent. She was taken to the hospital, where she refused to speak about what had happened. She sold the farmhouse within weeks, leaving the town and its whispers behind. But late at night, when she tried to sleep, she swore she could still hear it. The faint creak of a rocking chair and a soft, chilling voice saying, You'll come back. They always do.